thanks everybody for um, coming back swiftly. So uh, this was Rattle again in the film that you saw was uh, called The Fiction of Money, which the Alternative School of Economics made um, with their participants after visiting JP Morgan's um, trading floor because they were not allowed to take any um, videos or recordings or photographs. And Ruth will speak about that in a minute. But first we'll have Mama Di Ujaye, who's a um, community researcher and learning facilitator. And um, when I contacted her about joining us, she said, um, you need to know that I approach things slightly differently and from odd angles. And so she's interested in the interiority of things and thinking of living things as sort of more intelligent um, than the human. She's trained in horticulture and agriculture. And she currently creates uh, within community-centered knowledge um, learning journeys which explore the interface between um, community legacies of colonialism and uh, modernity which is constituted by it. And I think we'll pass out some things while she's speaking, so we'll see how that goes. Off you go. Yeah, thank you. So... Good to have a silence like that. What's going to happen next? <laughs> We're surrounded by trees, and this presentation is about presencing them and looking at or feeling through what trees are through the peculiar lens of undone science, the science that hasn't been done yet and remains invisible. We're going to start with a trailer, a short trailer of a film that will be shown as part of the Urban Tree Festival on the 20th of May at Camley Gardens, Camley Street um, Gardens in King's Cross, if you'd like to see it in the afternoon. So shall, can we play the trailer? creates presence in the world, we have to really understand the quality of beingness across the worlds. Using plural for worlds, you might recognize that I support the idea of the pluriverse. Um, the pluriverse is an idea that has been espoused by thinkers such as Arturo Escobar in his book Designs for the pluriverse, as well as Walter Minolo, um, who has various expressions of it which converge with the Zapatista idea of a world within which all other worlds fit. As homo sapiens of much of the northern hemispheres, it often feels that we have relegated the sapient part of ourselves in as much as we have relegated elderhood more generally. Knowledge has now become merely information, a formation communicated to us. I imagine lines and lines of data presented to us as truths which we ought to shape our lives in accordance to. 
it's why we talk about a post-truth society, because having, during the Enlightenment, defined ourselves as less, less as body, but more as a thinking head, our mental attributes have become our present sight of beingness. We reside in our heads. Now that beingness is being manipulated as artificial beingness, artificial intelligence, through the power of the algorithm. It feels as if we're drifting further and further from our bodies. As for body, this itself has become mere flesh, the product of deoxyribonucleic acid, using an assemblage of nutrients that we take in. The dance of the chromosome has become subject to CRISPR technology. We can create the body as we wish, it being so very manipulatable. A design concept materialized at best, an inadequacy of responses to a toxic environment at worst. So how can we understand in this time the quality of beingness? Maybe if we find it difficult to do so in, as homo sapiens of the global northern worlds, then we might need to turn to the alter Cartesian experiences of the global south for inspiration. I mean, we've already started to do so, right? In the forms of things like yoga or the concept of buen vivir, which is for some a corruption of Sumat Kose, of Andean uh, wisdom holding. We may also need to turn to the alter Cartesian existences of the more than human which we dwell amongst. To do so, we may have to develop other sensibilities, the sensibilities of our neglected bodies. We may still yet be able to reclaim ourselves from ourselves and reclaim the sapient. The context is that some of us are only now recognizing that we have entered a new intensity of climate collapse. We are living with a stage of the Anthropocene in which the significantly urbanized centers are disproportionately contributing to the environmental destruction of everywhere. So how do we respond to this? It feels as if it's the right thing to do to explore the lives and legacies of all of the beings who have made a significant contribution to the shaping of both modern spatialities and temporalities, and whose produce and descendants are still to be found in urban spaces. In the context in which we are today, we can focus upon the trees and those communities whose lives have been affected by their contributions to UK urban spaces. What is necessary is that we take a more systemic approach to understanding how tree products from the different regions and ecologies of the globe have contributed towards the making of urban space. A tree is a being with history. Um, I don't know if you noticed on the, um, during the short trailer, trees have been around for approximately 3.8 billion years. And humans, as Homo sapiens, less than 200,000 years. We are so come lately, aren't we? And yet we suppose that we can then order the trees. We understand them enough in the short, you know, the last five minutes, <laughs> as, as is often um, used as a metaphor of life on earth. We suppose that we can um, decide and define for them. We know, we feel that we know enough. But there are, not all beings are historicized. Um, history has often been a deliberate narrative of great men, especially by the colonized world. And there are consequences if you're outside of history. 
for one, your subject to being consumed, as being regarded as in service to humans. As such, you become dematerialized, invisible. And advocacy by and for you becomes, by default, a political event. I just wanted to list, I had a longer list, but I wanted to list some of the tree products that are around us. Um, there are so many that we don't think of as trees. Um, in the clothes that we're wearing, in the things that we read. And if not directly tree, then trees as fuel have contributed significantly to the, the presence of lots of other things. But carnauba wax and lipstick, um, salicylate, I can't pronounce it, <laughs> in aspirin, um, some unusual things, LCD screens, detergents, rayon and acetate, imitation van vanilla flavoring, fillers in so many medicines, methyl cellulose in your biscuits. Um, I used to think it was grass, but I now understand that tree waste um, provides a bulk of a lot of food that we eat. Table tennis balls, chewing gum, shampoo, bubble bars, cork boards, cola, ice cream. And we haven't started to mention all the different kinds of timber. If we're going to take a more systemic approach to understanding how tree products from the different regions and ecologies of the globe have contributed towards the making of urban space, um, it's not something that be, can be carried out within the confines of this talk, but certainly it's something to encourage anyone who is doing design or planning work to cause to be factored in. Perhaps this could be re rephrased as, in order to better understand urban spaces, we also need to recognize the connected ecologies of all of the more than human environments including the environments which, because of the nature of modernity, have become hidden. What do modern understandings of the environment, what we refer to as the environment, conceal? And how is that concealment affected? And what's the impact of it? Taking trees um, and the environment tends to, talking about trees and the environment, tends to stretch to the impact of living trees as individual trees and as part of public spaces. But who says trees hold themselves and measure their own relationships with humans as individual trees? Yeah? Maybe trees only operate the philosophy of tree um, behavior should only be considered collectively, yeah, and not as individual trees. What's the impact, therefore, of thinking of them as such? Um, and as such, the concern is for the environmental services of trees, because, of course, we're still within the story of man being dominant to nature and that nature being subservient to humankind in all of all ways. And for myself, as one who considers myself indigenous, but I use the word indigenous here to mean somebody who is responsible for living with the planet, um, who takes that responsibility seriously. Um, so it's a, holding a sense of being responsible to all the worlds that I share with others. So therefore I think of our relationship with trees has much more to offer in terms of mutualism as more than human beings with a much longer experience of the planet than we have as humans. If we can, rather than just think trees into our consciousness, we instead feel them, feel into them, their intelligence, 
and work with that, with the intelligence of our own bodies. Maybe we can find ways of responding to what I call, <laughs> what I'd like to refer to as their global call for earth sanity. Listen to trees, after all, they're ready everywhere in our lives. So I gave out some cards earlier on, and um, I'd like you to take a look at them and what's written on them. And I would like to ask that those of you who have a tree product written on their card to stand up, please. If you can't stand, then wave your hands. Or both. <laughs> Don't be shy now. We want to see the trees amongst us. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to call out a list of trees that people should have. So if you've not yet stood up, if you hear this name, please stand. If you don't hear any of these 31 names, sit. <laughs> Naysbury. N A S E Berry, Naysbury. Cloves. Coffee. Brazil nut. Soursop. Otahiti apple. African long pepper. Breadfruit. Plantain. Orange. June plum. Palm nut. Pimento seed, anato, avocado, limes, guinip, cacao, shea butter, sorrel, cola nut, bisi, lemon, green bananas, nutmeg, tamarind, cinnamon, Guava, coconut in all its forms, <laughs> mango, aki. It's a lot of trees amongst us every day. You can see it. So many names there, uh, names you've probably heard just for the first time, right? And some may be familiar. Urban tree products and their use has contributed to the unmaking of the ecologies from which they are derived. I think here of cloves and wood pulp, sandalwood and mahogany, teak and cocoa. Some of these processes are relatively contemporary, others are historical, so the damage that has occurred tends to be dropped from current narratives, and in this way they become invisibilized. The people who are from those disrupted ecologies may also have experienced co conflict or deprivations as a result and have become migrants or those seeking refuge. I mean, there's much complexity around the reasons that people move, yet we do need to consider the societies and economies of those people and cultures who grew alongside these species, even as we reflect upon the contribution of these species to the making of the, a European urban landscape. Do we think that all this matters to how we go on to engage with our own narratives of design and being? So here's another exercise. We're going to pass around a fruit from a tree that's widely distributed across the city. They're sold in supermarkets and markets. They are a fruit. Please take one and pass it back. Yeah. 
and we're also going to share some smells that come from a variety of trees that couldn't be present. <laughs> They've made their excuses. Take a tissue and just have a smell and pass it on. Do you recognize those smells? Smell evokes memory. What are the stories those trees are telling to your body? What are your memories about those smells? because you're eating pieces of date if you're eating them, um, have relatives with all kinds of other palm, such as palm oil, which is so maligned. But what would palm, the palm oil or the palm tree from which it comes, Elias Guinensis, what would it have to say to us? Were we able to listen to it? We maligned the tree, but not the person who circulated the tree. I would like you to consider what you know about these things and as you taste the small piece of fruit that is being passed around, perhaps connect with the intelligence of your own bodies, your own senses, and see what the smells and the taste evoke. I'd like to share a fun fact about many city trees in that so many of them are immigrants. The London Plain tree, for example, owes its genealogy to a cross between tree species native to Central Asia and one native to the Americas. The tree's growth habit makes it highly tolerant to atmospheric pollution, a useful quality considering the state of the air in London streets. But there are other migrating trees too, ginkgo biloba, or the maidenhair tree, the black walnuts and monkey puzzle tree, some of the horse chestnuts, the quince, the medlar, and you know so many other exotics which were brought over during the height of the making of botanical gardens in the colonial era. And some, to some degree, this continues. What do the trees have to say about this movement? Even though trees from all over the earth are important for city life in these ways, what perhaps tends to be more overlooked are those trees which are sacrificed as living beings for their bodies. That's one way of looking at it. This being, their stems and branches as timber for furnishings, buildings, boats and artwork, musical instruments, jewelry and their wood as wood pulp, their various essences as rubber, as beverages, as glues, as fillers, fixatives, food additives, food itself, aromas, incenses, perfumes and dyes. We might say that we cannot see the trees for the wood given their vast numbers of products that arise from the bodies of trees, both from the wild and industrial forests of the world. Much might be said about how we regard each other within modern lives and spaces. How is our idea of space and body shaped by the Mignolian statement of coloniality constitutes modernity? A final thought is about the bodies of trees, something to consider as we work with them in different ways as a reflection of how we understand their orientation in the earth. 
We might, for example, wish to explore tree-ness from the point of view of its relation to the soil in which it's embedded. Given the complexity, though, of the soil, we know that it, is a, it in itself is a living thing. It produces itself and is a being that is co-constitutive of all of its elements, which is also its own environment. How would another major organism orient itself in relation to another living being? So how do trees relate really to soil? Are tree roots perhaps more akin to a site of mutual sym symbiosis? Is it a point of exchange between trees and soil in deep con conversation? Are roots more like nerves running through the substrate earth? Is it because we are upright and bipedal beings that we see everything as oriented in this way? Might we be incorrect and trees are actually waving their branch legs in the air, trapping the sun's energy to feed their more extensive brain-soil interface and using fruiting mechanisms to travel. It's a whole different way of looking at things, and maybe we need to take some of these different ways into consideration. To even begin to imagine what such non-human philosophies might be, we might have to go beyond what the eyes alone can comprehend. We might have to invite in a multi-sensory cosmosensing rather than simply a cosmovision. So I invite each of us to spend a little time each day exploring the languages of our Earth elders. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> straight on because we're running a little bit late, but that's, that's fine. So we've got Ruth um, next. You can stay here, Mama, here. Um, we can, we've got Ruth next, and she um, set up the Alternative School of Economics with Amy Fennec, who's sitting um, here as well. And um, they say it's, it's sort of both an artwork and a way of working because it links um, artistic practice with self-education, and the films that you saw um, were sort of made, made by them. Um, the Alternative School of Economics began in 2012 after um, the sort of financial banking crisis in 2007, 2008, when everything from education to, um, uh, to um, immigration was sort of framed um, around in economic terms with the sort of response being austerity. And so the Alternative School of Economics is trying to um, set out ways to learn together collaboratively and as a social practice. And so, yeah, here's Ruth, hopefully with yeah, her slides. Just waiting for my slides. Um, so, yeah, the Alternative School of Economics, as Judith said, is a collaboration between uh, me and Amy Fennick. And we make art that questions economic doctrine and knowledge hierarchies. And um, we do that by looking at global political issues and how they connect lived experience, how they connect to lived experience and everyday lives. And we also use um, feminist organising and alternative economics as forms of resistance. So, I want to talk to you about this project Tree Time that we're working on. Um, we're very interested in the um, economies and ecosystems of trees, and we've been thinking about this in relation to climate crisis. So think about thinking how like value and time around trees can offer us a different way to understand the timescale of climate crisis. Um, we're working on a, this project, Tree Time, um, uh, with an artist-led organisation in Thamesmead called TACO. And um, at the moment, it's in sort of research and development phase. So I'm going to talk to you about some of our other work and the ideas behind it and how they're coming together in Tree Time. So Thamesmead is in South East London. I'm sure lots of you have heard of it. It's a, originally a brutalist housing estate. It's, it's very big. Uh, it's actually got sort of lots of phases um, to the estate. Uh, and uh, it was built on this social ideology about sort of getting back to nature or giving, offering access to nature. And at the moment, it's undergoing this major redevelopment uh, led by the landowner and the housing association, Peabody. Um, I think it's one of Europe's biggest development sites for that. Um, they're actually, as part of this, they've done a tree survey where they have 
like evaluated something like 53,000 trees in the, in the uh, estate and costed what the value of those on various different um, levels is. Um, but we were interested in it as this new town and the sort of ideologies around that in its, um, its location as a... As a uh, it's built on a former marshland, so it's actually quite climate vulnerable. Um, its character as an area with an ethnically diverse population and, and this, the fact it's undergoing all this change and, and people are thinking about the future there and what, what it means and what it could be. Um, so the Alternative School of Economics is a socially engaged uh, art practice. Um, so we use processes of learning together. This is more our modus operandi than this. <laughs> Sitting around tables with people, you know. Um, uh, so we'd like use creative things to, use creative processes to demystify some big concepts. And we see working collaboratively and collectively as um, inherently political because we're trying to sort of um, open up those processes and methodologies of art making and also demystify, uh, sort of reclaim economic ideas as well. Um, this image is from a, a past project in Manor Park called Rabbits Road Institute. Um, this is another thing that we did there. Um, this was a whole lot of what we were doing around um, the uh, about money and like the intangibility of money. And we were doing things with children, so they built a bank and then smashed it up. <laughs> it's <was> really fun. <laughs> Um, and this sort of relates, I suppose, to the film that we watched earlier. And the, 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 that was with the adults, um, the one that was in the, um, in the break. Uh, you know, this was the, the intangible flow of capital and adults, like, trying to think about, like, what they'd seen on these trading floors and, and process that um, and the fiction of money. Um, so this is a creative way to think about finance and money and our attitudes to them. So in free time, we will be doing... We'll be using creative processes to look at things like green economies and um, you know, policy and environmental economics and really this incompatibility between nature and financialization and how kind of sticky that is. Um, so one of the things we're doing initially is speaking to uh, individuals about specific trees and using those as starting points to have much bigger conversations about time and value and um, climate and nature. And we're going to make some radio shows for Radio Thamesmead, which is Taco's um, community radio station. Uh, this is a tree showed to us by Ian Holt, who is the estate manager of Lesnes Abbey Woods, which is this ancient woodland that um, is next door to Thamesmead. And he wanted to show us this, this tree in particular because it is coppiced, but it was coppiced 100 years ago. So this is 100 years of growth and it's got four trunks but we can't know how old this tree is because, because it was coppiced. So it's all really interesting going on about time there. Um, we had this kind of bigger conversation with him about the woods and how it used to be a timber crop um, wood. A lot of ancient woodlands were uh, in the UK. Um, and, you know, there's something interesting about going on about industry there, about how there would have been a whole industry around that, uh, about, around that wood, but now the industry is leisure, um, access to nature, well-being, um, and it, we're kind of interested in understanding these these changing economic e economies and value systems that are operating around trees. So I'm going to go back to some other projects that we've done. This is uh, one called True Currency, which was about feminist economics. Um, I think feminist economics and environmental economics is very closely connected. Uh, they're both about care, they're both about um, interdependence, and they're both about sort of trying to find different value systems uh, for our in, sort of re reorientate our economy around those value systems um, so we also made radio for this project we made a podcast um, called true currency you can look it up it's one of your favorite platforms um, and we talked to we talked to people who are kind of really experiencing the brunt of economic um, policy at the moment in terms of feminist economics, so like mothers and carers and migrant women. Um, we also talk to like academic researchers, um, community leaders and activists. Uh, and we did this through a residency at an arts organisation called Gasworks. And we also made connections with local organisations. Um, so this was a children in a children's centre talking about women, uh, talking to parents about being women in the economy. And we also worked with a really fantastic um, feminist organisation called um, IRMO that 
Indo-American refugee and migrant organisation in Brixton, where migrant families um, support each other. Uh, and we made this, this, this all, where all of these voices and stories wove together into this podcast. Um, we did that with the help of um, a, pro- a production company called Social Broadcasts. Uh, so there are six episodes. There's ones about worker struggles. There's ones um, about how sex workers work, all different things. And there's one about time. So this thing about time, this, in this episode, uh, it weaves together... Uh, the story of um, the testimony of a uh, mother called Claire, and then also an interview with an academic, Lisa Baratza, whose work is about like time and care and interruption and motherhood. And time is something that just comes up again and again in our in our work. Um, this is a this is another project also about time um, called The End of the Present, and this title comes from the order. Or, comes from a book called The Order of Time by um, Carlo Rivelli. So our project, this project, The End of the Present, was all about the different senses of time in which um, ecological crisis and financial crisis op- um, operate. So the sort of boom and bust of financial crises uh, versus this slow, cumulative, impending doom of climate crisis. <laughs> um, so the public part of this project took place online, it was 2020, so remember this, we're <laughs> on Zoom, um, and we, we developed this like co-research process online, um, everybody in their different places was um, trying to answer the question, where does a crisis begin and end, and they all had different crises and things that they were looking at from um, colony collapse disorder, bees, to like ocean acidification, and they mapped all of these um, onto this uh, online tool, this Miro board. Um, which was organised as tree rings because we really didn't, we were really resisting this idea of a linear timeline and that, you know, history just doesn't follow a neat line like that. It's much messier and inter- more interconnected. Um, so, yeah, the tree rings, this one, there was one version with, the, with um, deep time in the middle, but this one actually had the future in the middle and deep time is around the edge and everything is coming in. Um, and from this, we developed a digital publication with creative writing and stories and essays. Um, and it explored some of those, those subjects and crises, like the Latin American debt crisis. Um, this one was about uh, global trade and the um, tragic deaths of those in the, progress of, in the process of migration. Um, there was another about ice caps mating, melting and colonisation and boreal forests and um, weaving these stories together. So the last project that I wanted to mention before I come back to tree time was um, is speaking to the city, which um, you'll have seen at the beginning. We were really very delighted that Rattle were playing um, over the top of this. It was brilliant. Um, this was at Phytology, which was which is a tiny um, space. Someone was talking about tiny spaces earlier. A tiny artist and community-led nature reserve in Bethnal Green, which is just down the road. And... Um, it's a really interesting space because it sort of, they, through the whole little nature reserve, they're exploring ideas of use and value and resilience and wildness all in the city. Um, and the billboard is in the nature reserve, in the tiny nature reserve, but facing out towards the city of London. When you're looking out, you can see the skyline of the city of London. Um, and, and I'm sure, as you know, London city is this incredible financial powerhouse, but it's right next door to Tower Hamlets, which is um, London's most unequal borough. There's extreme poverty, and it's right next to this extreme wealth. And so that was the condition that we were thinking of, and we wanted to respond to that position by speaking to the city. Uh, So we made a series of statements um, that evolve and change each week over a period of um, four months from autumn to winter. And it's like a sort of puzzle or a game uh, where each word morphs into the next one um, by adding and covering the letters, and it tells this narrative of resistance. So, back to tree time and Thamesmead. Uh, I want to talk more about time, and I'm going to use some of the contributions that Amy and I made to the glossary, except hilariously time didn't make the cut, so I've just got my version here. Um, so, time... An occasion, moment, or experience, a duration of past, present, or future, 
a period measured in seconds, minutes, hours, days or years, or by change, growth and decay. So there are many modes of time, um, you know, as you've heard from True Currency and the end of the present and speaking to the city. Um, as humans, we have a set amount of time on Earth, maybe 80, 90 years if we're lucky. Um, we measure our days in hours and minutes and we measure our lives in decades. Um, and, you know, as you heard in True Currency, there's, there's things that affect our experience of time as well. So, you know, caregiving uh, is one of those, gives us a very specific experience of time. But we're also affected by capitalist time, which is in the, is in the glossary. So capitalist time, a system of interlocking temporalities under the dominance of capital based on notions of productivity. So that affects us, it affects our bodies, you know, affects us in big ways. Um, and I think in Western democracies, it's also very closely linked to political time and political timescales. I'm thinking of how government, poli government terms lead to very like, short-term thinking, um, which is very problematic in terms of environmental policy in particular. Um, and all of this is different from deep time. So um, Mamadi was talking about deep time of trees as well, the, the time scale of geological events just vastly, unimaginably greater than anything with a human scale or of human plans. Um, but it's not to say these things aren't interconnected. You know, like um, in, the, in, the, in the end of the present, we were thinking about that, you know, fossil fuels, the deep time of fossil fuels <laughs> leading to or being connected to the situation we're in now with them being burnt. Which brings us to crisis, which I'm going to read. Crisis, a condition of instability or danger where a situation has reached its worst, requiring urgent action. Um, for many of us, grasping climate crisis is difficult. Um, and there are, even though there are more and more tangible things around us, from leaves um, dropping early of trees to catastrophic weather events, but you know, I know it's it's it, it, for a lot of us that can lead to either sort of a sense of panic or helplessness about how we um, progress. Um, but we think that tree time can help. Uh, trees operate on this, this parallel time scale to humans, some shorter, a lot longer. Uh, they're, they're helpful to us. As we've heard tonight, you know, they're essential for shade and cooling and water tables. Um, but you know, we know that trees can be monetized. That's all what we're here to talk about today. Um, but we think tree time Tree time is parallel to or oppositional to uh, capitalist time. So it can help us think about an economy that's interconnected. And we want to, and interdependent. And we want to use this, these ideas to develop some like, collective practical actions within Thamesmead to meaningfully respond to climate change and the future of that environment. Um, so just going to end by saying that we are going to be organising some events about time and trees and value in Thamesmead. Um, so please do get in touch if you'd like to hear more. Follow us on Instagram. And if your interest and in, you know, work response um, re resonates with that, then we'd love to hear from you. I think we go straight to Julian. Yeah, thanks very much, Ruth. I think that sort of leads really nicely onto Julian, who I actually don't need any notes to introduce. <laughs> He's a um, um, director at East, and at East, sort of, uh, we work in uh, sort of we work in public realm and landscape, but in often very compromised um, places um, like edges of estates or high streets, and um, sort of. I think we want to, Julian to bring the discussion back to London and the city and, and sort of how, how, we, how we work in the city. So he'll be talking about time and money and also about um, sort of specific terms that are um, in the London currency like urban greening factor and biodiversity net gain and how different boroughs have different sort of ways of dealing with this. So yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Judith. I've, I've got the task of following all these amazing presentations, and I'm going to, and time is money, I'm going to go quickly 
um, and I've got quite a lot to say. Um, although London has taken a long time to build and mature, many current building projects are built quickly. Uh, they're out of step with the time that trees and spaces require to evolve. And we need, as we're talking about money, and I'm going to say this in italics, our, to increase our rates of interest in London's green spatial future. And I'm going to skip across a few money jargon themes using some projects, including Easts, which is my practice, and Judith's. But I'm not going to talk about the projects because that will be too much at this state. So they're going to be glimpses of projects to illustrate how we might do this. This image is... I'm sure you've seen this image. It's, a, it's from a daguerreotype that portrayed a human for the first time ever, having their shoes shined just there at the Boulevard de Temple in Paris in 1838. It's also, I realise, the first photo of public space. In fact, it's the first photo of trees. And you can see a boulevard of trees. This is a boulevard, and it's Paris, so one thinks of boulevards. But this is pre-Hausman, and as we all know, Hausman cut roads and boulevards across the city fabric, but that was later. This one follows the city that existed. This was shaped by the defensive alignments of the city wall, and you can see the older, bigger trees at the top there. Uh, and at the same time, newer trees, you can see it filling the curb edges and filling the footway space three lines deep. And they're shaped by the carriageway and the movement of horses. And in terms of design, this feels like it's set somewhere between intention and consequence. But whether they're shaped or shaping, the abundance of trees in the street is about making a generous infrastructure for human experience, part of a payment plan, in italics, you could say, that invests in a longer-term green city. And this idea of planning for the future, using trees to shape a city, has also happened in other European cities, including London. So London here is shown in the shape of plane trees. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of... Prom it, it, in a way, it's a strategy of bringing the trees to the front. It's not this idea that people often have when making new developments of filling uh, space with trees in a kind of watercolour way. It's about actually bringing the image of London forward uh, actually making the trees be the city. Um, and so this extension of time that I've referred to is really very much follows the last presentation, is about thinking in more than one way about how long it takes to complete a project and at what point economic value can be realised. In the late 19th century, at London's embankment, Basil Jett's sewers created a new green edge to the river. It was at substantial cost. The ambition was to correlate the need for underground servicing alongside the creation of a curving green public embankment, and the design pioneered the use of plane trees in London, and it was intended to last for hundreds of years. It was a long-term project. You can see the complex tree pit, construction and engineering. That's where the hidden costs lay. Uh, and the same could be said of most tree planting, that actually what you see is only possible by investing in what you don't see. And that's, I think, often why you have a little bit of a struggle to pay for decent trees up front, because they're expensive, as has been said earlier. And yet, has, as has also been said earlier, the value is absolutely critical and central to living together in the city. We made a project at Acton Town Square. It's nearly 20 years old now. The trees there were integral to a sense of permanence and generosity. And they were brought to the site individually in large lorries from Germany. Uh, and the tree pits were designed to allow the trunks to get larger. The clay granules, it's a little detail, I know, set around the trunks, allowed them to breathe. What we really enjoyed was that this granite plate uh, is, is part of the city and the trees are coming up from below. And we wanted to gently acknowledge that these are collaborative conditions nature in the city. And at Borough High Street, St George the Martyr Church, this one's nearly 30 years old, uh, and this was with Carolyn Roy, who helped to specify these trees, which have become quite 
strange, actually, quite sculptural. And the word oddity was mentioned earlier by Robin, which I thought was very interesting. They've, they've grown like figures, making distinctive spaces uh, and influencing ways to move, meet and sit. They don't have that thing of, you know, possibly clear legibility is not completely in play here because it goes down to the ground. But they're really lovely, I think, and they've got an intimate scale next to the wide road. Um, and at Bream Street in Hackney, we designed the buildings to pull back from the trees which were existing. Again, this is a kind of eccentric space. And I think there's something that would be nice to talk about in terms of the kind of rational planning of buildings and the eccentricities and oddities that we have to start to articulate in terms of design when dealing with existing and new trees. Uh, and in Hackney, uh, we're designing housing and spaces together. That's one thing we should do more not separate them out, but think about them together. And here we've got a little street park with some trees whereby the building is standing as the background. Same thing in Southwark where we're designing housing and a park together. And you can just about make out that the housing is pulling its stomach in a little bit. Can you see that? Yeah, sort of sucking its stomach in a bit to give the park space to breathe next to it. But beyond the projects, it's necessary to take a larger view to understand how to exert and marshal our interest in a greener city. This early drawing East made many years ago, testing to see if London could be considered as a forest today, simply illustrates the fact London is a forest by UN standards. It's also a national park city. And as one of the mayor's design advocates, I highlight the fact that the GLA is looking to increase canopy, tree canopy cover by 10% over the next 20 years or so. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. We need to plan a scale, and to do this requires more than just quantity and numbers. It needs good ideas about the city we live in. And to have good ideas, we need to find specific ways to describe it. This drawing combines words and shapes, and in turn it helps to focus on a spatial attitude to design. Valleys, chases, hills, plains, forests, it helps us to imagine different ways to plant and manage in very large quantities. And the East London Green Grid, which was initiated by the GLA, it's quite an old study, but it's still really relevant and valuable. It was drawn up in conjunction with many local authorities and many design consultants, and it made a costed strategy ready to implement. These projects were made through many hands, and I think it's an iconic project as a spatial strategy which foregrounds a connected green network. So instead of thinking about getting two green spaces from the town centre, it actually puts the green spaces to the front, in front of the city, which seemed beautiful. And London-wide policies, of course, are about steering good greening, and you have the urban greening factor, as mentioned earlier, that's good. It's a good thing, it is just about metrics. Uh, and I agree with the vertical planting thing that Irene was mentioning. Is it feels, feels a bit like it's not really a way to do it. It feels mitigating rather than productive. But it's a GLA requirement to use detailed metrics to quantify urban greening for new developments so they meet the London plan policies. And there's also a government legal requirement coming uh, later this year. It will become legal to increase biodiversity by 10% in a development that requires planning permission. But to put these numbers to good use, you have to think spatially. So, for example, an arboretum, we think of an arboretum, conventionally it's a kind of disc or circle. It's round, but it could be unwound and laid along the high streets, making it stringy, richly experienced in time and space. And at Hatcham Gardens, we, we were working on this TfL red route, this uh, linear high street that used existing trees alongside new. We made a grid with a single species of trees and then elsewhere there were a whole mixture of trees which uh, took on a kind of individual uh, quality. But the point that Mama made about the collectivism of trees I thought was very interesting because in the end by making a space out of a street that's special as well as spatial you start to actually make this a bigger idea so the little plaques start to talk about the bigger collective city. So we need Strong policies to encourage longer-term green growth. Southwark Council's streetscape requirements, for example, are impressively stringent. They require a tree design statement as part of the planning process. Any removal of existing trees 
must be justified, and where necessary, they must be replaced with a like-for-like -like trunk girth, and also a replacement of the canopy size lost. That's not easy, as the long-term growth of an existing mature tree over 15 years creates much more canopy than many smaller trees over the same amount of time. So the effect of this, which is one of the benefits of the policy, is to place new emphasis on nurturing the trees that exist. It also means that new housing developments need to be designed with more care, not just relying on a smattering of new trees to do the job of greening. So this image is about us designing a new street garden that looks at uh, reshaping, turning tree pits into a public garden along the street and maintaining the existing mature trees. And you get a massive tree canopy over the top as well. Another term, net to gross, it's a great term for offices. Of course, you want the net to be close to gross. We don't think of public spaces like that, but perhaps we should. Uh, and that's because the meaning of net in this case is not just to do with money, but it's social, environmental, well-being, biodiversity, air quality, atmosphere. It's, ton it's a ton of things that we all experience. And I took this photo a long time ago when we were working at Wellhall Pleasance in South London. And it seems bucolic, uh, but actually it's more interesting than that. It actually holds, a, holds an idea as to how to plan the public realm of the city efficiently. So the project was to restore and enhance the Pleasance, and what happened was that the district surveyor in the 1930s decided they could happily bring together, right next to each other, medieval moats, Italian gardens, allotments, woodland walks, swans, roses, and floral shield, all in one place. And this idea of unlike spaces brought together in proximity is something that London does really well, and yet designers balk at because it can be rude and surprising. But these differences in proximities, I think, is part of the stuff of the opportunity of the oddities that we talked about and the eccentricities, and therefore the value. And so we have to keep thinking. We have to keep actually uh, redesigning the wheel, I think, in order to perceive each space. That's why the housing developments, as they come forward, have very specific opportunities to green not just generic ones. At Brink Cross, we made a peculiar project for Related Argent, where we made a temporary park within an existing space that was in the process of transformation. We laid one space over another to allow existing spaces to be having new uses, and at one point it seemed to float like a carpet. Two parks, one on top of the other, old and new. 1950s parade of shops invites you into this layered garden, you can choose which way to go. You can enjoy interruptions. I mean, the city is full of interruptions. Everything interrupts something else. You're constantly negotiating. And then at Parishwood Park, we made another set of spaces to make better relationships with the housing that surrounded it. The green was a bit unusable. Um, and one thing we really enjoyed was that you really don't have to design everything when you're designing. You can leave things. You can make relationships happen just by doing small things. Uh, climbing trees with a ladder. I didn't do that myself. Throwing stones from a raft is nice, and I'm nearly finished, don't worry. At Eltham, again, high street project. Here, we wanted to celebrate the place as it existed, and in uh, Eltham, close to Wellhall Pleasance, we uh, wanted to uh, really do what they had wanted to do before, which was to bring an arboretum the Victorians were very uh, aspirational about that, as we know. Uh, and re what we did here was really celebrate the place, uh, trying to bring coexistences between a road crossing and an arboretum, uh, sharing the street uh, so that even servicing vehicles can use the space safely with people. And you can also sit down and think of other things than money. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.
very much, Julian. Yeah, I'm so sorry. We've completely run out of time. We really wanted to have a discussion with you all and ask some questions. So I think all we can say now is come and join us in the pub afterwards, and then we'll hopefully have a talk. Then I've got a few quick announcements. I want to say thanks to um, our friends at Open City who have been helping to promote the talk. We don't need the benches. Thank you. I think we really need to run. <laughs> Uh, so they, have, they helped us to promote the talk and they're currently looking for proposals for the Open House Festival in 2023 and also mentioned the Open, uh, the Open Tree Festival <laughs> um, and their program uh, which is running this week. So Mama mentioned the, um, ha the, uh, there's the Happy Man Tree shown at the Castle Cinema in Clapton tomorrow evening and on Saturday there's a big event in Camden Nature Park. And please follow the Architecture Foundation for more um, talks. And there's one more tree talk in November. And yeah, hope join us in the pub for discussion after. We really need to leave the barbecue at uh, 9.30. So I'm very, very sorry. Yeah. <laughs>